Excellent, excellent. So I'm going to go ahead uh, and just quickly go over to the screen share mode then, and I'll jump into my PowerPoint and kind of use that to keep me on topic. I'll warn you guys in advance, I talk way too much sometimes uh, and can go on these little tangents. So this will be there uh, mostly to keep me on track as we go through. So. There we go. All right, so uh, the presentation I put together today, I'm calling a horror 101, so you wanna make a horror movie. Um, you know, I've done so many different kinds of films um, in my tenure. I started off at a very young age um, in uh, filmmaking. I was 18 when I got my first job. I was 19 when I won my first Emmy, and the first, seven years or so of my career was mostly spent in a lot of uh, TV, documentary, History Channel, Nat Geo, Discovery. It was great because I got to do a lot of work, um, you know, in my chosen field, but it wasn't really where my passion lied. In fact, my passion has always been with horror movies. Ever since I saw Cujo at the drive-in at age four, um, I have just been utterly hooked. I find horror filmmaking to be one of the most fun and engaging mediums um, because there's a lot of thinking outside the box, a lot of creative problem solving that comes into play when we are kind of living in this fantastical world. Um, and so today, that's kind of what I'm going to talk to you all about. A quick overview of what I've put together. I've broken this into three parts. And as long as my time management isn't horrible, I should be able to get through all of these. Um, <clears throat> the three parts that I wanna get into today, part number one, I'm calling theory of the kill. Um, this is really going to kind of start way back in the early 1900s with a little Soviet montage theory. Uh, we have to talk about kind of the gifts of the Russians before we can kind of get into uh, kind of modern kill scenes, uh, if you will, because we're going to borrow directly from that. Um, once we've kind of talked about, you know, Eisenstein and Kushloff and some of these folks, and I promise I won't make that super long because let's face it, we want to get to the blood and guts. Um, we're going to take a look at a couple uh, different kill scenes and then we're going to dissect them. I think this is going to be really important when we start thinking about um, how to make a horror movie, we want to effectively sell a kill. And, you know, again, this is going to come to that creative problem solving, and this will be borrowing heavily from that Soviet montage theory to help kind of elicit a new meaning. Now, once we've gotten through part one, part two is going to be a segment I like to call making a monster. Uh, and we're going to look at the kind of the creation of three different monsters throughout my work. Um, we have a more standardized uh, possession from the Hanover House. Uh, folks notoriously will ask, how did you make the actor's eyes all black? So I wanted to give you an inside look at the uh, black sclera contacts that we utilize. It's a little cringy to watch the actor put it in, but you know, this is a, a horror workshop. So we are gonna take a look at that. Uh, from there, we'll look at a prosthetics makeup build of our witch character from The Witching. Uh, and then we're going to uh, kind of get into a little bit of animatronics and building. Uh, and we might have a cameo from, uh, from my, my little buddy, uh, Fluffy over here, uh, as we get into uh, White Drift and the making of a full body werewolf. Um, time permitting, once we've gotten through all of that, the last thing I'd like to talk about today is building tension. I think this is one of the most important things in a horror film. Um, and so I do want to dedicate just a little bit of time specifically to that. Um, so at any point as I talk today, as I said, I can like talk way too much. So if you've got questions, please throw them out at any point. I love questions. I love answering them. Uh, so don't hesitate to throw them out if they should arise. So I'm going to skip this stuff because uh, we already had an introduction. I will say, uh, you know, if you're digging any of the clips that you do see today, um, feel free to check out uh, any of our films. You can find them on Hulu, on Amazon, on uh, Tubi. Um, 
there are a lot of great ones available. The only one that is not currently available on streaming is the Hanover House, but it will be out uh, within the next few months. We are rebranding it under the name The Calling, and then that will be available as well. Um, I would love to kind of start off just by showing you folks a little 60 second uh, clip. I like to kind of, uh, you know, get a, get a little killing going on. Um, this 60 seconds is just kind of a smorgasbord of uh, a bunch of different projects we've worked on over the last few years. There's a lot of really cool kind of effects. There's some cool monster builds that happen. Um, so we'll kind of take a peek at this and then we'll jump into some Soviet montage theory. You know, and I'm going to actually stop my share for one second just because I did not click the ever so important share sound and optimize for video button. All right, let's try this again, shall we? Uh, and we are not going to watch the entirety of this six minutes. That would just be a little overkill. So uh, here we go with just a little snippet. stop that right there. Um, so within that kind of little uh, batch of clips that you just saw, we're going to actually kind of unpack some of those um, a little bit further as we kind of go through. Um, so let's jump right into part number one today, the art of the kill. And to begin with, we're going to talk a bit about the theory of the kill. Um, so the first thing that we need to talk about is montage. No, I'm not talking about that quintessential 80s training montage, the thing that we've seen you know, in Rocky. We're not trying to get things done quickly. When we're talking about montage here, we're actually talking about the Soviet terminology for montage. And this is just a synonym for editing. Um, this was an approach to editing developed by the Soviet filmmakers of the 1920s, such as Padovkin, Veritov, Eisenstein. Um, it emphasizes dynamic, often discontinuous relationships between shots and the juxtaposition of images to create ideas not present in either shot by itself. Um, if you want to think about this, the best way to kind of break that down is simply one plus two equals three. Um, you can take two shots that are seemingly unrelated, and when you put them together, when you juxtapose them and put them side by side, we actually can create a third meaning that's different than what, you know, was ever even shot. Um, we can kind of skew and manipulate our audience through this juxtaposition of shots. Um, what I have up here to start with um, is part of the Kushloff effect or the Kushloff experiment. Uh, Lev Kuleshov, uh, again, was a Soviet filmmaker in the 20s. Um, and he really was just infatuated with the idea of juxtaposition. So what we see here are stills from this video. You can find the entirety of this video online. It does feel a little dated, a little aged because, well, again, it was done in the 1920s. Uh, so that was a hundred years ago at this point. Um, so what Kuleshloff did is he actually took a pretty standard close-up shot of an actor. And that's what we can see here uh, down the sides. The actor was a blank canvas. He did not emote at all. And by intercutting various objects, a bowl of soup, 
a child in a coffin, a woman on a couch, the filmmaker was able to elicit new meaning. So much so that when this was shown to audiences, they raved about this actor's performance. They talked about how hungrily he looked at this bowl of soup, how sorrowfully he gazed at the dead child, and how lovingly he looked at the woman. In reality, he didn't respond to anything. What the Kuleshov effect proves is that we as an audience are going to naturally respond to different images. And when we're presented with a blank canvas, much as what we see with the actor here, we are able to take our own emotional responses and project it into the, the uh, video. So really what these audiences were seeing were not a performance of the actor, but rather their own kind of inward responses to these images projected onto the screen. And that right there became the basis that would be used in Soviet montage theory. Um, as I said, I wasn't gonna spend a lot of time talking about the Soviets today. So let's talk about how this applies to horror and the horror genre. And we're gonna do so with what was one of the most notorious scenes in a horror movie. And that is the infamous meat hook scene from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. When Texas Chainsaw came out, we were in the late part of the 1970s. We were a very conservative-based America at that point, and horror movies were not a major mainstream phenomenon. So, sure, you know, we saw the rise of new horror that kind of came into play with Alfred Hitchcock and movies like Psycho, but horror was still relatively you know, in its infancy, um, at least kind of this new horror. And, and when I say that, that's everything that's not like Dracula and the Wolfman. Um, and so when this particular film came out, and as I said, Texas Chainsaw is like a notorious, notorious film. Interesting side note, Gunnar Hansen, who plays Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw, was actually a native Mainer. Very nice, very sweet guy, but he was cast because he could fill a door frame. Um, this movie was filled with debauchery. They actually cut people in this movie. They beat Marilyn Burns, the actress, senseless in this movie. Like they literally beat her unconscious. The food, the rotting flesh that you see in this movie is all really there. Um, this movie was funded by the mafia. That's something that a lot of people don't realize. Um, the reason, however, outside of all of the production things that made this movie kind of so debaucherous, if you will, um, this scene in particular was one that garnered this movie an NC-17 rating. Now, in today's standards, NC-17, what, what even is NC-17? Well, in the 1970s, um, there was a whole morals commission for cinema that was making sure that films didn't go too far. Uh, these days, movies like Saw or a Serbian film would not make it through those particular commissions. Um, and this scene almost didn't make it through. They had to fight. You see, NC-17 was a rating that was even stronger than an R rating. And so when the critics saw this, they were so convinced they watched a woman actually get impaled on a meat hook. We're gonna take a moment to go through and watch this scene. It's only 40 something seconds long, but I want you to pay careful attention because this is a great example of that Soviet montage theory at work because we never see a point of penetration. Everything that we see in this scene is 100% implied, but that shot sequencing had these particular you know, critics convinced that what they were seeing was an actual point of impact with this, which garnered the rating. After a lot of fighting, they were able to actually overturn this and the film held with an R rating, which allowed it to be screened in theaters, which led to a lot of its box office, uh, box office success. Uh, but I digress. Let's take a look at the scene and then we'll go ahead and break it down shot by shot.
going to go ahead and stop this at this point. All right. And I'll close that window. All right. So let's go ahead and start to break this down. So in this shot by shot analysis, we've got kind of our back to kind of medium long shot with Leatherface bringing um, Marilyn Burns' character towards the hook. We cut to the inter insert shot of the hook itself. So in this moment, we have one plus one, right? So we have our shot establishing the motion towards the hook. We continue that motion. We have the tight shot of the hook. So we know it's going to come. However, as opposed to, you know, actually seeing that penetration, we dump back out to this wide shot. Now in this instance, Marilyn Burns actually has on a harness and she's simply set into position. There's no actual penetration. We sell that kill, however, with the immediate next shot where we cut into the tight shot of the reaction. And this is going to be a kind of a trope or um, this is going to be um, kind of a device that you see utilized often in horror films where we're going to establish an action and then cut away to either a blood splatter, to a reaction, et cetera. So we don't see the kill itself actually happening. Now there will be instances where yes, we will see those kills in just a little bit, um, but we're gonna talk about how those are shot and framed to allow us to actually utilize things like puppetry, um, fake bodies, et cetera, to be able to sell that gag. Um, the next kind of clip I wanna take a look at is from uh, what is, I'm gonna say in my top two horror films of all time, technically this is a horror comedy uh, and this is Sam Raimi's uh, cult classic hit, Evil Dead 2. Now, uh, just to kind of set up what you're about to see in this particular instance, um, Ash, who's played by Bruce Campbell, has been possessed, or rather his hand has been possessed. Uh, and in an effort to stop his hand from kind of going crazy, he is going to lop it off with a chainsaw. Now, this is another instance of one plus one equals two, except here, instead of cutting away from the action, we're gonna use a motivated camera move that's gonna push past the action into a facial reaction. From there, the filmmakers are gonna supplement with a blood sprayer. This is simply a garden pump that is used to project blood onto our actor. We won't see the kill itself or rather the wound itself, but instead what we're going to see in this particular instance is going to be uh, kind of again, that reaction to sell our kill. So let's take a look at this. Oh, and of course, ah, well, uh, I did not plan on that one. I'm sorry, folks, we're gonna have to skip our friends at Evil Dead on this point. I should have spot checked my link slightly better. The downside about pulling links from established movies, oftentimes they do violate copyright protection laws and disappear. Uh, this was here several days ago, but no longer here. So instead, let's go to one of my movies. Um, actually, we, we can talk about this, I guess, first. So here, uh, this would be our breakdown. We're in kind of a wide shot. We see Bruce on the floor. We see him lift the chainsaw. Hand is now out of frame. Chainsaw comes into the camera, uh, into the frame as the camera continues to push in. We end on a tight shot of the face blood spraying back. Um, so again, this is all one shot, but we never see the actual action. This does allow the filmmakers to use a live chainsaw in this take, right? So we get that motion, you supplement that with the blood spray and we're able to again, give the illusion of chopping off a limb. All right. So <clears throat> from here, folks, we are going to take a look at a quick kill sequence from one of our films called The Witching. You can currently find this one on Hulu and Amazon Prime. All of our kills in this piece happen at the very end of the film. This is gonna be 43 seconds. Um, and this was a really fun kind of gag. I want you to pay special attention to the stick and how it bursts through um, Jesse's chest within this scene. We'll talk about how we achieved that afterwards. Um, 
Is she drunk? Emma's dead. You'll all be dead too. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of this window. So with what you just saw there, folks, uh, there's a couple things I wanna talk about. <clears throat> Before we go through on a shot by shot analysis, one thing we need to talk about as filmmakers is working on a budget. Um, so with uh, The Witching, this is an anthology film. And if you're unfamiliar with that particular concept, this is very much like a Twilight Zone movie, um, like uh, the creep show movies that Stephen King did. Um, an anthology is essentially a bunch of small films that are assembled together into a unified whole. Um, for this, we worked with a company called RLJ Entertainment uh, and they came to us and said, listen, we've got these five short films that we loved from the festival circuit. We need you to kind of put together a framework that's gonna tie everything together. So for this, we decided that, hey, we're going to have a bunch of podcasters. They're going to go to this haunted location in the woods, much like Are You Afraid of the Dark? They're going to tell scary stories around the fire, uh, which is how we introduce each of these particular kind of vignettes. And then things go awry at the end as our kind of wraparound story turns into uh, what was one of the more bloody portions of the film. Now, we were given two days of production to shoot our roughly 13 minutes, um, and we were only given a $1,200 budget. Um, when you're dealing with uh, films in general, $1,200 is not a lot. Um, it's in fact very, very little. Um, I would say folks, for what you saw on screen, $800 of that went into uh, a bunch of our special effects builds. Uh, in particular, that of the witch, but we're going to look at that when we get into our making a monster segment. We had to be very selective because in our script, we had four kills that happened. However, we did not have the budget to do four glorified kills, and we did not have the time to do so. To put it into perspective from shooting, we had, as I said, two days, we shot 11 pages of script on day number one. This was all dialogue around the campfire. And we did this with a two camera setup just to kind of help us maximize that time. Um, day number two, we shot two pages and it was nothing but kills. This was a very long day, especially for our actress, Ellen, who plays the witch. You see, before we even started, Ellen spent six and a half hours in makeup uh, becoming that witch. Um, from there, we did move into our kills. And the thing with these kills was you don't get a lot of good takes because we make a mess. Things get bloody. So we did shoot everything with two cameras, which gave us uh, a little bit of flexibility in terms of uh, really, you know, kind of um, making sure we capture the action. But we really only had one good take for each of these kills within our time. Um, this is also why you saw a basic neck snap and a character who's taken completely out of the frame for the kill. Um, this was so that we could actually accommodate this on the budget. Um, the kill that we're going to dissect right now, uh, using kind of our Soviet montage theory, is going to be um, where Jesse here gets uh, impaled by the stick. Um, and this was done quite simply, folks. Um, with a really basic three shot sequence. Um, you see what happens is, you know, we see Jesse establishing the action as the witch comes up behind her. We cut to that low angle where we see the stick and get picked up off the ground. It's gonna be really important when selling this effect that your motion continues from shot to shot because that's gonna help us stitch this together and give the illusion that what you see is happening in real time. Now, it looks in this instance like the stick actually bursts out of Jesse's chest, but that's actually not the case. 
you see she's wearing a harness around her midsection. So she has a harness that goes over her shoulders that essentially has a giant screw on the front and a giant screw on her back. This stick has been threaded. So we actually screw the stick onto the front and we screw the stick onto the back. So it gives the illusion that she's actually impaled. But wait a second, I could swear that I saw this burst out of her chest. Well, kind of. What you actually see is the stick that's got, you know, just some goop on it. There's some latex pieces, there's some blood. And all that happens here, folks, is that stick is simply off frame. She's arched her back in such a way that that stick just is not viewable. Now in this motion, when Ellen steps up, she grabs Jesse by the shoulder. She motions like she's thrusting, but the real motion that's happening is with that hand on her shoulder, she's simply pulling Jesse back and arching her back. As she does so, the actual wound itself is hidden, but what we start to see as she arches her back, we watch that stick protrude and enter into the frame, given the illusion that we see this actually happening and bursting through her. Now, in case you were to ask, the standing disembowelment that was on the tree uh, that you see not long after this um, with Beth was done in a slightly different manner. With that one, you actually saw a point of penetration, right? The hand goes into the belly, we rip a handful of guts out. Um, in this instance, Beth is actually wearing a false stomach that is filled with guts. It's got a small membrane of saran wrap in front of it. So um, as the witch pushes her hand through that particular membrane, it breaks releasing the blood and then we can pull out the intestines to follow. So when we do show those actual points of penetration, it's really important, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that we do so in tighter shots so that we can essentially fake what's being seen. A fake body, um, you know, maybe we're just doing a close up on, you know, a fake arm or something like that. But generally, when we do go into those tight shots, we're looking at prosthetic builds as opposed to anything else. Um, so again, you can see right here uh, from one of our BTS images, you can see what I was talking about. So right here, we have that stick uh, as it attaches. And you can kind of look, if you look at Jesse's shirt, she's actually protruding a little bit. We're not gonna see that, but that is from the harness itself. Uh, and you can see our effects artist here, Greg, is simply layering in some blood, a little bit of viscera, if you will, to help sell that effect. Now, the other thing that does help hide all of these, all of the instances that we're looking at is we generally do work heavily in shadow. Shadow and darkness are your best friends within a horror film because it's going to help you one, obscure things, right? If it's dark, if it's shadowy, we're actually able to hide seams and attachment points and things of that nature that maybe you wouldn't see or that you would see rather if it was very bright and illuminated. We also utilized a hazer to kind of introduce that extra element as well to help with some of that hiding. Now, as I said, safety is gonna be everything. And at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share for just a second. Um, because we do, we use a lot of weaponry um, in this field. And I think this is an important thing to talk about because let's face it, making a movie is important. Yes, it is never so important that somebody should be harmed in the process. So safety is literally everything in what we do. Um, the razor that you saw on screen, folks, is actually a mold of a real razor. It is, uh, well, it's plastic. I have an ax right here. I love this ax. It looks real, right? It's not. In fact, when we made the Hanover House, we have three very distinct axes that we used. You saw one of them in a little snippet there that was literally planted into Jenny Anastasov's head. Um, what we did, folks, is we took one axe and we made three versions of it. We have first the real axe, and the real axe has a real head. Um, I'd grab that one, but it's sitting outside in my shed, and well, my shed is a mess. Um, however, that is what we made all of our molds of, and we used this same kind of uh, spray paint that kind of gives this rust finish on all of the axe heads just for consistency. 
So that real ax would be used to chop wood. We used it to put into a door and then the door then bled. Um, that was our weapon that we used whenever we actually had to put it into something and make it feel like a real ax. This is ax number two. Um, this one is made from a bendable plastic material um, or a bendable rubber rather. We use this ax whenever we're swinging it close to somebody. You know, if you get hit, you might, might leave you a little bruise. It's like, it's still, it's like kind of getting hit with a soda can, right? It doesn't feel great, but it's not going to maim or hurt you. Um, although we want people to think it's going to, it really should be nice and safe. Um, so we'll use this whenever we're swinging it around somebody, but not explicitly hitting them with the ax. That way, if we do happen to hit them, uh, again, they'll walk away maybe with a little bruise, but that is it. Uh, the last ax that we used was a foam ax. And we couldn't swing that one around because the foam would just flip flop in the wind. But that is what we would use to physically carve out and mold so that when we were you know, taking that ax and molding it into somebody's head, we would cut it out of foam and literally glue it to her head using something called spirit gum, which is an adhesive that we use quite heavily in this field. Um, if you decide that you really kind of dig the special effects and you want to start playing around, there's a really cool website called monstermakers.com that we get a lot of our kind of uh, props and uh, well, maybe not so much props, but a lot of our special effects um, kind of tools through spirit gum, uh, methacellulose, which is a thickening agent that we use for blood, etc. cetera. Uh, at this point, folks, I'm going to jump back into screen share. And we're gonna now move ahead to part number two of the day, making a monster. Um, so as we go through this, <coughs> I have uh, just a couple of things I wanted to show you. Um, up first is in the Hanover house, we kind of have two signifiers for our character of uh, Robert Foster. Um, when Robert is in his quote, possessed mode, there are two things that show you. One, he is covered in blood. And this is because of a scene that you see earlier in the movie that kind of uh, creates that transition, if you will. And then he applies these black sclera contacts. These are what will black out the entirety of the eye. Now, a couple of things. I am a big advocate of contacts on monsters. I feel like contacts are that nice little final piece to put your monsters and your effects build into the next level. Um, so as we're kind of going through this, the scleras are a full eye contact. And when you put them in, it's a little uncomfortable to watch. I will say for a good prescription contact, they should be just that. You should get a prescription from an eyeglass company and go through a reputable source. Um, these contacts that you're going to see go in ranged right about $350 for the pair. Uh, before we take a look at this, um, does anybody have kind of uh, any questions before we kind of jump into this next section? All right. Um, perfect. And thank you for sharing that link, Dave. Ah, I clicked the wrong button. I do that sometimes on Zoom. So let's go ahead and take a look at this segment. Uh, I am going to skip over that little bumper at the beginning. Here we go. That is? It is humongous. <laughs> So again, in this instance, folks, as you can see, this contact is huge. Um, Brian's actually going to take it and he shoves that whole thing up so that it's living in this cavity above your eye before you can pull it down. Um, 
it, I don't know. I've got this weird cringy thing when it comes to the eyes. Um, and so I'm not great um, about, uh, you know, putting stuff like that in myself. Um, now I will say folks, this particular contact, if you're curious where to get them, monstermakers.com is one of the best, most reliable sources. As I said before, you don't wanna buy cheap contact. You can buy them um, oftentimes out of Singapore, out of Thailand. Um, you can buy them much cheaper, but you have to be careful because when you buy them from these less reputable dealers, they don't adhere to kind of the same safety protocols that someone like Monster Makers do. And so sometimes they'll simply be painted contacts, which can cause infections in the eye. And that's something that we do want to avoid. Uh, before we move on to our next monster build, does anybody have any questions? Uh, all right, so then let's go ahead and move on. Um, so a second ago, folks, we did see the prosthetics from The Witching. We saw kind of our actress uh, at play. And so I do kind of want to quickly go through the basic build. Um, I'm a big advocate against using full masks when making a movie. And that's because a masks in general aren't very uh, emotive. Um, and be that, I mean, you can't really express in a mask. And that's why in a lot of horror films, we do kind of a multi-step prosthetic, um, you know, uh, build that happens. In this case, we worked with a fantastic artist out of Rhode Island named Christina Creeps. Uh, and so what Creeps did was we started with a full face cast of our actress, Ellen. And with a face cast, what we actually do is we use um, what's called alginate. And alginate is the same stuff if you've ever gone to like the dentist and they have you bite into that weird little waxy tray where they take um, a mold of your teeth, especially if you're gonna get braces. That alginate is the same stuff that we'll use when we do these facial casts. And so essentially we did an entire cast of her head, which we then created a reverse mold from and filled with um, a plaster of Paris. This then gave Creeps a bust that she could uh, work off from. So what she did is she went in and actually sculpted this. And as you can see here, we've got the nose and the cheeks would be separate prosthetics. The forehead is a separate prosthetic as is the chin piece. So this was a total of five pieces that would be adhered to Ellen. So you can see in the beginning, we have the first pieces going on. Now we have all of them on and you can see around the edges up here, that is the uh, spirit gum kind of at play. It takes a little time to dry. And that is why this process takes so long. Again, this particular monster build was about six and a half hours. And a lot of that is just so that the applications can dry. Now, once she's gone through and added the pieces here, we then move on to our next step, which is the foundation. So once the prosthetic pieces are on, Christina also does beauty makeup. And so she goes in here, she's adding all the makeup around her edges. She's hiding a lot of our seams. And then she'll go in and actually begin doing supplemental makeup, as you can see here, the eyes, et cetera. Um, you'll notice that from the early uh, in, uh, image of Ellen to this later one, Right around here, we actually add in the contact lenses as well. Now, as I said, for me, contacts are always gonna be that kind of final piece that puts your monster builds kind of over the edge and brings them to the next level. Um, sure, Ellen's eyes look normal. That creepy eye though, there's just something so piercing about contacts like that. Now for this uh, particular build, I will say we drew some inspiration uh, from one of my favorite horror directors, Mr. Sam Raimi. Um, and we did give a little love to Evil Dead 2 here. Um, and we did kind of pull a couple nods from our witch, specifically from the, uh, the deadites that uh, Raimi used in his films. We did take it a step further. And Sam Raimi was notorious when he made the first Evil Dead, he made it for $970,000, which by today's standards sounds like a lot. Um, that's like the equivalent these days of making a film for like $20,000, $30,000. And I only say that because they shot it on film and we have the wonderful world of digital and that was most of their budget. 
I digress. Rainey used a lot of outside the box filming techniques. Uh, and one thing in particular he did is he used two by fours for a lot of his apparatuses. He had a slide cam, AKA the Vaso cam, which was a two by four on the sawhorse that he lubed up with duct tape and Vaseline to get his sliding shots. And he had uh, a shot called the shaky cam. And we saw this when we watched the kill scene from the witching, when we're kind of tracking the person down. Uh, for this, you literally mount your camera to a two by four and you have one person on either side essentially creating a low budget steady cam. Uh, the last thing we're gonna take a look at, I'm gonna kind of jump ahead a little bit, uh, was from one of our last movies where I got a little bit ambitious. You see, while we were making The Witching, it was my first time working with uh, Greg and Creepy, and I made the mistake of opening my mouth. I do that sometimes. And I said, man, these effects are great, guys. We should make a werewolf movie sometime. So before we even like got a week out of production, I wasn't even done cutting the witching, they started sending me concept drawings and mock-ups. So we said, you know what? Yeah, let's do it. Let's make a werewolf film. So we created White Drift for this thing called Damnation Land, which is a horror film festival based out of Portland, Maine. Really cool kind of event. And we decided we were gonna make a full body animatronic werewolf. Um, now for this, we raised, uh, it was like $6,000 to make our film. Almost 4,000 of that went into the build of the warehouse, a uh, warehouse, goodness, the werewolf. Um, what I'm gonna show you right now is just a quick minute and 15 second segment um, that is going to kind of talk about the building of the werewolf. Um, you're gonna actually see the skull of this werewolf and how it works. And then we'll step back off and we'll take a quick look at Fluffy as he currently stands. He is a little beat up because, well, we beat the crap out of him during the movie, but uh, you'll still get a good sense of that. So I'm gonna jump ahead to the 144 mark once we jump in, but this way you can get a sense of how we go about actually creating a, a creature and the steps needed to bring it to life. And I saw one of their shorts They're coming. My team and I have been tasked with designing a monster for Damnation Land 2016. It's not just any monster though, it's a werewolf and everybody loves werewolves. So we wanted to basically turn that monster into something that can walk on two legs or walk on four, depending on what mode it's in, hunting, stalking, you name it. I'm wearing the head, it's a profile there, so you can kind of get an idea of the shape of the creature that we're going for. Due to the fact that we're doing such a canine head, um, there's no actor expression, and so we had to go to our, our form, go to our basically our Halloween mask, and start adding in places for it to be expressive, whether it be the brow so that it can get angry, or the snarl so it can show its teeth, and the mouth will open and close so that you don't get a good shot of the teeth and the inside of the mouth. Um, we're playing with, with being able to move the ears, but the practical considerations mean that it's expensive, we have, we have the capability. We uh, are limited only by funds and imagination. We're really excited about this project because- I'm stop right there. So um, that's gonna kind of give us, you know, that initial kind of sense and cool. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share. So as you can see in the beginning, we start with a skull. Now that skull was simply paper to begin with. They kind of cut it out uh, and kind of built it up and then they glazed over that to make that initial form. Um, when they were making this monster, once that skull was made, you see that Greg outfitted it with a bunch of different, um, uh, a bunch of just different wires to help control a lot of the form. They made several versions of the skull. One of them was used in what you saw with that clay sculpt. So early on, once we have the skull, um, Joe, who was the first gentleman that you saw in that piece, actually went through with clay. He sculpted the whole piece. Once that's done, we use the same process that we did with Ellen as the witch and create a reverse mold of it. Uh, and then instead of filling that with plaster of Paris to create a, a, a bust that we mold off, we actually filmed that with a polyfoam uh, and a silicone kind of melding 
uh, to give the form of the head. Um, what you end up with, and I will say he's a little bit uh, kind of bunged up at this point, um, this would be kind of the head of what we call fluffy. Um, the cables inside at this point are a little bit kind of wonky, but uh, you can see I can do some basic mouth movements uh, where his lips would snarl have uh, unfortunately snapped off at this point. Um, the ears would move and twitch. Um, the only thing with this that I wish we could have done differently was actually make him uh, blink, and I do that like you guys can see the eye. Um, the eyes did not uh, did not blink a whole lot. Now, what's actually interesting is we do kind of two uh, kind of controls with this. This actually would sit on top of an actor's head, and so as kind of Joe was wearing it before, it kind of would go right over the top of somebody's head like this, and then the suit itself would actually come up, and the head would be hidden underneath the shoulder portions. And this would allow the actor to kind of move through and get those really big kind of motions. Then when we move into the tight shots, and there was an example of this tight shot in that initial kind of um, uh, kind of clip reel I showed you, we had the, the werewolf kind of coming down from up, up top. Uh, and that was all puppeted, where inside you've got the hands operating it. You had a secondary person operating the cables, which you can kind of see inside, we've got all these different cables that were used to control it. Um, so you had one person controlling the ear twitch, the snarl, et cetera, from the outside, another person handling uh, kind of head position, mouth position, et cetera, as you kind of went through and just puppeted your beast. Um, I'm a really big proponent of practical based effects. I know we live in a day and an age where digital is like all the rage, but unless you have a really big budget, digital effects are hard to sell and they date themselves so quickly. Um, in the horror world, there's a love-hate relationship with special effects. There is a love relationship for practical and a hate for digital. Um, so there's a really big kind of renaissance in bringing back a lot of these practical-based effects. Um, the best way I like to kind of best analogy, and then I'll move on kind of the last part of today, um, my favorite, like growing up, right? There were two movies to me that were super pinnacle. Uh, Alien, 1979 would have been one of the first. Alien, I love. And to this day, those xenomorphs still look awesome, right? It's just a dude in a rubber suit, but there's something about the way the actors interact with them. There's something about the real motion that doesn't age. When I was 12 years old, I saw a movie that was mind blowing in the theater. It was a movie called Terminator 2, which is still a favorite movie of mine today. And it used cutting edge CG at the time. The problem is now some almost 30 years later, that CG doesn't hold up. It actually looks like a bad Atari game uh, in some of its instances. Maybe Nintendo, maybe not quite Atari. It's, it's still pretty bad. Um, and yet it was made you know, trying to do some math in my head, like 15 years after Alien, but yet it doesn't hold up as good because it relied on technology that's constantly evolving. Now, eventually we're gonna hit a point with digital technology where we really can kind of keep up with, uh, you know, it won't quite, uh, you know, um, it won't quite date or age as quickly, but even if you're a Marvel fan and you go back and watch like the first Avengers movie now, the effects definitely don't look nearly as good as when they first came out. So that's my last kind of cautionary tale there. I'm gonna go back into screen share mode. I know we're running uh, into kind of the end and my last piece is gonna be very short for you. You see, we've been talking a bit about the art of the kill. We've been talking a bit about making a monster, but we have excluded the most important part of a horror film, which is building the tension. Um, this to me is what separates a good horror filmmaker from a not good horror filmmaker. It's all about building tension. You see, there is this dude, his name is Alfred Hitchcock. He's kind of like the godfather of horror, at least as far as the new horror movement goes. Now, I love this Hitchcock quote. To me, this sums up everything you need to know when it comes to building tension. There is no terror in the bang, only in the anticipation of it. What does that mean? It means that there's no terror in seeing that moment of the kill, all of the terror, all of that anxiety, everything is what comes before it 
and the act of physically building up to our moment. Um, at this point, folks, I am going to step away and show one other quick film clip. This is from one of my favorite modern directors. His name is Ty West. Ty West um, does a lot of stuff for Glass Eye Pictures. He did a movie called The Innkeepers. This, to me, was kind of one of his best. I wish I could have found a slightly different clip online because he's got uh, a couple other scenes that I think are a little better at illustrating this. Um, unfortunately, again, when working with copyrighted material, though, you've got to work with what is available. And this one will still do our trick. I want you to pay attention to several things as we go through. This scene lasts about two, two and a half minutes. And I want you to watch the use of music um, in particular as we're going through. I want you to notice how you feel at different points during it. The music cues are going to help kind of motivate that. We'll break it down right afterwards. Uh, and I will say after this, folks, I only have one final slide to get through. stop right there. So with what we just watched, why does this scene work? Well, first of all, actions are obscured by shadow, preventing the audience from ever getting a clear picture of the scene itself. Um, again, there's something just inherently creepy about working within dark environments. We're able to obscure or keep things from our audience. And oftentimes that not knowing helps create or elicit a sense of fear. There's a lot of motivated camera motions. You'll notice the camera is constantly creeping in. It's constantly moving forward. Again, uh, kind of making a claustrophobic environment as it will. The music is gonna uh, continually build. In fact, they use one of my favorite devices through here and that's the string rays. Not only is that music building, and when I say building, I'm not talking about building to a crescendo like a Marvel movie, but rather we have a pitch shift on the strings. So what's happening is we're slowly raising the tone of that particular scene, right? So tonally, it's just raising and raising and raising, which again, triggers a response in us. Um, something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen. It's building, it's building to something. What's it building to? Now, when the music stops, normally the viewer begins to expect something is going to happen. Either we're at a moment where, oh, it was nothing, it's just a dripping faucet, or the music stops and we're waiting for what's next. Now, in that instance, the music build up, or we're at the faucet, but there's a little something unsettling there, right? We don't have the music, we hear the drip, but is there something else? We still feel like we're waiting for something to happen. Now, when that music comes back in, that again signals us as an audience that an event will occur. Now, what I was hoping to show you from this movie, Ty uses this to great avail. And this is why I love Ty West so much, is because sometimes he'll use these, this device 
to build up the uh, intensity of the scene and then you'll get hit with your kind of quintessential jump scare. But more often than not, Ty West will slowly push in on something, slowly push in, the music will raise. It's been 45 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, and we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're anticipating, we just want the thing to happen. And then nothing does, we cut away to the next scene. You see, going back to what Hitchcock said, it's all about the anticipation for the bang, not the bang itself. So in those instances, you know, Ty can really put us on this sense of unease and helps break the mold of creating these predictable jump scenes that you see utilized by people like James Wan throughout like the Conjuring franchise, et cetera. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share um, because at this point, folks, that was my final slide for today. Um, does anybody have any questions? I've talked like a super lot and uh, I'm happy to uh, answer anything you folks might have today. Corey, I think people have been pretty uh, mesmerized and intrigued along the way. I, I haven't sensed a whole lot of people stopping and asking, just kind of loving the ride that you took us on this evening. That, that was great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I kind of geek out over this stuff a little bit, so. Uh, that's well, it's pretty captivating. I, I, I think that people were like totally, uh, totally captivated this evening. Um, if you do have any questions, pop them in the chat right now. And Wesley's comment, wow, very awesome, I think kind of sums it up. So thank you so right. very much for this evening. Oh, of course. Um, of course. It, it was great. I know we'll, we'll be. Um, spreading the link around so a lot more people are going to be watching this i'm sure um hey i, I want to before you go and before people go um we have a challenge every month and we give out a prize to the winner the challenge this month is to come up with a uh under 30 second scary suspenseful scene and um corey i'm hoping you'll be the judge i would love to and I'm going to put the uh, prize in the chat right now. It is a Loom Cube lighting set, which is actually pretty cool. So many of you have cameras out there. You can uh, make some pretty cool stuff with this, um, especially if you get into horror and uh, suspense. I think a, a cool lighting set that goes anywhere will be tons of fun. So our next session is May 13th. And our presenter is uh, Rebecca Conley, a, a freelance video producer, editor, photographer, and a video creative producer for Maine Public Broadcasting. So we'll have more details on her and uh, we'll have the challenge, the official challenge wording up on the website pretty shortly and out to everyone in, a web, in an email. So Corey, thanks again so much. Uh, we look forward to having you in person when we do some uh, in-person events later this year, get some fake blood in our parking lot and uh, loose arms and feet scattered around. Most definitely, that would be awesome. And, and Dave, would you mind if I did one quick uh, little plug? Absolutely, oh, yes, I, I, yes, um, of course. Uh so I just like to always say this, folks, uh, you know, I geek out about film, but I'm not just a filmmaker. Uh, I am also a teacher. I teach in the communications and new media department at Southern Maine Community College. Uh, I know uh, Mr. Boardman here sends me a lot of great students uh, every single year. Um, but I will say, you know, if you're, uh, I'm assuming y'all are in high school right now, if it comes to be kind of those next steps and uh, you want to kind of pursue this in college, come see me over at the school. I'll give you a tour at any point. And uh, we have this kind of fun in class well, a couple times a week. So uh, keep us in mind when it comes time to choose your college. Yes, I'm so glad you said that. Um, Corey's program is incredible. My students have been going there for years and they rave about it. So uh, keep that in mind. The other plug I'm going to make is for two weeks this summer, we're running two uh, summer camps right in Waterville. The first one is July 5 through 9. It's a GoPro filmmaking workshop. It runs uh, 8.30 to noon every day. It's free. And the following week, July 12 through 16, is a environmental filmmaking workshop. So 
come learn how to tell stories that might get people to think twice before they uh, fire up that that big truck or uh, toss their trash out the window. Um, we'll have more information on the website. All right. Hey, well, thanks again, Corey. Um, everyone out there, we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you again next month. Stay well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.